had to find your name in one Kubrick film that you can turn off once you start it. It's impossible. He's got this fail-safe button or something. It's impossible to turn off a Kubrick film. Every shot has some special effort put into it, some extra bit of concern with composition or lighting or traveling or something. And so he never lets down. He worked so hard on the imagery, you know. I mean, he, I believe Stanley probably started a movie with several images in his mind. And then let the story evolve from there, got it very concrete. Shining is the perfect example of a horror genre movie that does not employ the classical horror genre visual elements. I think the thing about it is that he creates a setting that has a certain kind of peacefulness that belies the story that he's telling. This is our Colorado lounge. Oh, it's beautiful. You know it's extraordinary from the very first shot. Those first helicopter shots tell you that somebody's at the helm who's saying, you know, I'm not just going to give you a helicopter shot. I'm going to give you the longest, steadiest helicopter shot and how graceful they were and how misleading that is in terms of what's coming. Nothing indicates that the horror may happen in this movie. And it's a very conscious decision because by creating that kind of visual style, you're creating a sense of normalcy. But by doing that, the horror that the characters are experiencing becomes much more believable. <laughs> You know, there's something very intuitive and, and wonderful about the way he will find these things that will just become archetypal. The blood coming out of the elevator and the twins, it's very much reminiscent of Diane Arbus's photographs. He'll just totally throw these images at you in a way that will just set you off. The greatest one for me, though, is still the image of the written page, just pages and pages. Your terror in that movie comes from the characters. You're being frightened by a realization of who these characters are. She's curious about what he's written, and he has piles and piles of typewritten pages that all say, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. That's the point at which there's a kind of turning point in the, in the movie. It's the most perfect representation of insanity that you could possibly come up with. How do you like it? <laughs> When the snow begins to fall outside the windows and it begins to build up and you go out into it and it's always blizzard. It's never cool with blue skies, you know, it's always dark and blizzard and blowing snow. That sense of cold just accumulates. Action Shelley! Go <laughs> Stanley with his you know photography sense it had this great idea of using fog so that it looked really cold, but he never wanted to see the fog move, you know. It just gave the sense of, like a filter almost. So you could only shoot when the wind was less than three knots. It took a long, long time to get all the shots we needed. He'd seen some war pictures shot in snow, some black and white, and he realised that there was a diffusion, the cold, foggy get in snow, and he said, let's try it. So we did, and it, and it was brilliant. I mean, he wouldn't have looked as cold without that smoke. It was actually a poisonously yellow-looking set with the lights. Daddy! Stanley did all his own lab timing, so by the time the dailies came back, they'd cranked up the blue and cranked out all the red and yellow, and it looked as it looks in the film, frigid, wintry, cold, mysterious place. Filmmakers always look for ways to allow the audience to participate in the movie. One of the ways to allow the audience to be active participant is to have mobile camera. Mr. Allman? Yes? I'm Jack Torrance. Oh, well, come on in, Jack. When it comes to The Shining, you think of the, the camera prowling. You think of the camera close to the floor. 
It's almost as if there's another character in there following people about. And of course there is. The hotel is keeping an eye on all the characters. So perhaps the camera in The Shining is the hotel. You're right there with the character. You don't know what's going to happen. Is something going to attack the little boy? It feels very dangerous. It feels very invading. It's a film about film, in part. What was the necessity of traveling down that hallway? Well, he did it because he could. I think sometimes Stanley just did that because he didn't want to be like everybody else, and he had a very specific way of telling a story. It's not that he wanted to show off, I'm so different than you, but he said, why does every story have to be told the same way? And I think that Kubrick had reached a point, frankly, that the more profound ideas that he had expressed in earlier films now had to be presented to a different audience. An audience that had started to find the horror film diet very attractive and commercial. One thing I could never stand was to see a filthy, dirty old drunkie howling away at the filthy songs of his fathers. You can identify Kubrick in all sorts of ways in any one of his films, but one of the really admirable things about him is that he chooses such different projects. There are linkages between them, but they're very different sorts of films, finally. One of the characteristics that's so striking about these films is the sense of the visual that you remember long after you've seen the film. I think a mark of a great director is that you leave the theater with certain images forever marked on your mind. And that's certainly true of Kubrick. I first met him in New York probably in the very early uh, 1950s. And he was already becoming a mythic figure, was already this famous person who had started shooting for look when he was three years old or something like that, you know, so he was protege-ish. He was the most provocative, intelligent filmmaker I've ever known. His experience in, in using a still camera probably really helped him, you know, from a photographic point of view. And he certainly understood the way you tell things with visual images, and I'm sure a little bit of that at least comes from the fact that he had been a still photographer. I don't think he was obsessive about images. I think he just had great taste and was a great photographer and cameraman. So he knew where to put the camera all the time, you know, and so it looked seamless. So, I mean, it was wonderful because all of his pictures looked wonderful. Invariably, the images would be startling. Certainly, Barry Lyndon was creating a time and a place. And so what he did was very effectively take us back to that. And you had a sense of what it was like. If you can imagine that he was a consummately gifted photographer professionally, he was also a consummately successful chess hustler. And if you think about that and combine the mind of a really complex chess player with the eye of a perfect perfectionist photographer, you have Stanley. One thing that I love about Stanley's images is that his compositions were very simple. They were very simple and very direct. But there's something about that directness that's very disturbing. He's very good at, at creating his own sort of stylistic use of various techniques. Kubrick's films have fabulous camera movements. When you think of 2001, you think of slow pans. When you think of Barry Lyndon, you think of zooms. Zooms is something that was used very stylistically a lot in the early, you know, in the 60s and 70s. But Kubrick uses it in a way, in both The Shining and in Barry Lyndon, in ways that reveal things to you over a course of time. I know that the more technological knowledge the director has, the better filmmaker he becomes, simply because he understands the emotional aspect of image size. I think a sense of environment and place was important to him, and the wide lenses always included where the person was, as opposed to what you see in a lot of movies where it's sort of floating heads, talking heads, where everything is blurred around. When you put a long lens on and do what we call a close-up, it tends to blur everything else around you, and it's just kind of a talking head. That's one thing. 
The, the second thing was the movement, the sense of movement through those hallways. That's increased like crazy with a wide lens. You get the sense of enormous movement. And somebody coming at you, or a, a, or a strike at you, or a move toward you or away from you, is exaggerated enormously in a wide lens. So if you talk about Kubrick, he exactly knows what the lens will give him. A very conventional way of creating a horror in a close-up would be to employ long lens, where you really don't know where the horror comes from. What Kubrick did in Shining, he employed the opposite. He employed 17, 14 millimeters, where you see everything, and you, you don't know where the danger comes from, but you can see the space it may come from. Ma? And that's scarier to me than, 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 than the conventional way of conveying the, the horror genre. You know, even though he didn't operate all the time on his films, I mean, certainly handheld camera things he would operate on because he had a real understanding of what he wanted to do, specific to the way he wanted to move the camera. Kubrick always moved the camera. <laughs> it's almost like the Steadicam was invented for Stanley. He lit like a lot of great artists. He had that kind of an eye. He went all the way through the complexities and back to something terribly simple. He used real lights, screw a light bulb in and turn it on and shoot. That's one of the great things about having a director who is also a photographer. Every one of Kubrick's cinematographers had said that if he wasn't a director, he'd be the world's greatest cinematographer. He gave me a Nikon with three lenses and a package of Tri-X film and a bunch of instructions. The first one was never use a flash. He was consumed with visuals. He was really a photographer. I mean, that's what he did, you know. He saw you in relationship to your surroundings. That's what spoke to him. It just meant more, I think, to him, those elements in the composition. Stanley had his own Stanley Kubrick technique. Because he was so strong on imagery, he just loved the fact his creative team, you know, his lighting guys and the set designer, everybody understood what was going on and why. I mean, the costumes and the hair and the makeup worked together. So I worked very closely, for instance, with Milena. It's interesting to look at Stanley because uh, from uh, the way he chose the shots in the Clockwork Orange was totally different from the way he shot The Shining. And it was fascinating how, you know, in Barry Lyndon, he had uh, uh, special lenses and the candles. And he taught me how, you know, explain, because he liked to explain things. He was always very kind and gentle whenever you ask him certain questions. I asked him once uh, about the, the very wide angle lens he was using in Clockwork Orange, 9.8, and he told me how it should be used. He would take ideas from anybody. He was voracious for, for people's views on things, whoever they were. He would listen to what people had to say, and he would take what he thought was right. The responsibility of an artist is to raise questions, not to provide answers, is to hold a mirror up to society. And Kubrick is a great artist, perhaps one of the greatest that the cinema ever had. His responsibility is to reflect the society back upon itself as he sees it, and not to offer cure-alls or suggestions for how to improve our daily lives. He was not a predictable filmmaker. And his understanding of the craft, uh, his understanding of how you tell stories using the visual medium are really unsurpassed. Every single story somehow was so mysterious in the way the story was told. It so kept you guessing, how's this gonna turn out? What's gonna happen next? I can't even imagine. And the genius of Stanley is you can look at a movie of his 15 times and you'll still give up and you'll be surprised all over again. And I don't know anybody else who possesses that kind of magic. I'm really, really, really sorry that Stanley died. That a great deal of the joy I expected in the movie viewing end of things for the rest of my life is 
has disappeared in a flash because he won't make those movies that I that I love to see. And I think besides losing him as a friend and a mentor, I'm I'm really sorry as just a a film goer that he's not doing this anymore. He was a great friend, a fund of monumental knowledge, a mind-opening person. If you just think of the stuff he did, and he just saw it out in front of him and approached it with wildly high intelligence. To say he was a great craftsman is to seriously understate something. Stanley didn't change much. I mean, his acceptance speech about Icarus <laughs> at the director's guild, I mean, nothing could be more perfect. The myth of Icarus, flying too high for success, he says, and people always took that as a, a moral tale about hubris. And he said, let's make better wings. <laughs> if one day there's a final history written of the motion picture when it disappears as an art form and is replaced by something else, the name of Kubrick will stand at the very top, very large, very prominent, very powerful as one of, of the cinema's greatest innovators and artists.